You're listening to the Barcode Podcast with your host, Chris Glandon, serving cybersecurity straight up with no chaser. Let's hit the bar and grab a drink. Tony, what's going on, man? How's it going? Not up bad. Finally fixed the damage to the wall those wrestlers caused. Our cybersecurity insurance did cover it, though. Nice. Yeah, man, that is good to have. Hey, man, I'm going to execute this new drink for you. We call it the infection. Ooh, sounds menacing. Yeah, bro, it's our new number one bestseller. So it goes a little something like this. Kick, kick. With your favorite shaker filled with ice, one ounce of gin, one ounce of Midori, fill it with equal amounts of grape juice and club soda, shake it, strain over ice. One sip, it'll infiltrate your entire system in stealth mode. You won't even know what hit you. Sold. Man, that is good. Hey, let me start a tab. Here's my credit card. Ah, no worries, man. I already got it. Sweet. Well, I got to run and catch up with my buddy. Fresh off the jet from San Diego. All right on, man. Well, stay classy. See you next round. Ted Harrington's mission is to help you get security right. He's a leader of ethical hackers, helping communities build better, more secure software. An established author, keynote speaker, consultant, and podcast host, specializing in penetration testing, secure software development, and other related areas of cybersecurity. Ted, my friend, thank you for joining me. Welcome to Barcode. Awesome, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pumped to be here, dude. Cool, man. Talk to me about your background and how you got into cybersecurity. Yeah, I came into security from the entrepreneurial angle, which uh, I think surprises people sometimes when they, you know, they sort of look at my background. They're like, wait, you wrote this book and you do all this stuff. But uh, that's actually where I came from. You know, I didn't um, actually, I wasn't the guy hammering on a terminal at, you know, age five, like, like a lot of people who actually work for our company uh, are like that. And I'm really fortunate to be around them. But I guess my story was that um, you know, I've always just always been inspired to try to solve problems and I always wanted to run a company and all this stuff. And so I started my first company when I was in college and that company was really focused around, it was like events logistics, which doesn't sound interesting or sexy at all, but it was a real problem that my fellow college students had and I went out to go solve it. Um, that was when I learned that I don't really like dealing with the individual consumer. Um, you know, individual consumers are emotional and petty and they make decisions out of yeah, emotion, not rather than when you work with companies, they make emotion, make decisions out of logic and reasoning. And at least most of the part, uh, there's still a lot of emotion in, uh, in business to business. Uh, so I did that for a few years. And then when I graduated college, uh, I really, I determined I really wanted some mentorship. And so I joined a company that the, the founder and the CEO of that company, all he wanted to do, he didn't want to run the company more. He just wanted to mentor. And I'm like, yep, let's do that. I mean, it's amazing that I found like literally exactly what I was looking for was someone, an entrepreneur who would mentor me on entrepreneurship. And that's definitely yeah. one of the things that uh, I would recommend to anybody is find a mentor as early as you can and just milk them for every piece of knowledge that they can share. Uh, after that, I went on to become the CEO of this, uh, this tech startup that was focusing on water conservation. And you can sort of see these themes start to reveal through my journey, which was, you know, first it was like, I knew I wanted to start a company, but not any kind of company. And then it was like, okay, I want to do a company that matters. And you realize, okay, well, the company has to matter. I think water conservation matters, but the market also needs to want it. And as important as water conservation is, people just weren't willing to, uh, to spend money on it. And as I was deciding what to do next, that's when I connected with who's now my business partner. He had uh, started our consulting company a few years prior, bought out his co-founders, and he was looking for somebody to help him sort of reimagine the company, take it to new heights. And that's, as soon as we met, it's like, I got on a plane on Saturday morning. I was in San Diego at the time. I flew to Baltimore where he is. Uh, he meets me at my hotel like an hour later, like 
10 hours later, we're standing out on a street corner, beers in hand. We're like pretty drunk and we're like, let's do wow. this, man. And yeah. uh, that was almost, uh, that was about nine years ago. And, and today we've built this security consulting company into something that I'm, I'm really proud of. We've helped, you know, hundreds of companies solve tens of thousands of security vulnerabilities. And I mean, these are the companies that everybody knows, like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, Disney and Netflix, you know, the list goes on. And so that's how I got into it was really looking at it in terms of how can I solve a problem, which is what entrepreneurship is at its core. And then when I was first introduced into security and I realized, wow, this is nothing but hard problems and it really matters. I mean, security really, really matters. And I knew that I'd found my forever home and uh, security is, is my life now for sure. Nice, man. So the consulting company you're referring to is ISE, Independent Security Evaluators. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the services you provide? Is it strictly security consulting or do you perform pen testing as well? Yeah, the pulsing heartbeat of what we do is ethical hacking. And so that, of course, manifests in a number of forms. Um, security research, obviously, being one of those. That's not a, a service. We don't get paid to do research. Well, I guess there's a, a there's been a few occasions where people have paid us for research. But primarily, it, that's uh, an activity that we do in order to publish research and talk about it. Um, our core offering is security assessments, where we, you know, companies who need to build better, more secure systems. They're trying to understand their vulnerabilities. They're looking for someone who can apply that malicious mindset. And that's, that's what we do. And, uh, and then in addition to that, there's things like you mentioned, you know, security consulting, uh, penetration testing. It, that's such a difficult term because it means so many different things to so many different people. I mean, <laughs> I'll even tell you a story about that. You know, in my book, I wrote an entire chapter about the problem that is this confusion about penetration testing. Like, what is it? What does it really mean? Mm -hmm. An entire chapter. And yesterday, someone reached out to me on LinkedIn, read the whole book. His entire career has been penetration testing. And his question was a really, really good one. He's like, where'd you get this definition? I've, I've actually never heard this definition before. And that was, I, I kind of had dueling reactions to that. Because on, on one hand, I'm like, well, that validates why I needed to write this book. Because if I'm writing what is the definition of the terms and people who are the practitioner of that themselves don't even know, um, that's a really big problem. And I'm not, this isn't a value judgment that guy. I'm not saying he's like ignorant or stupid or any that far from it actually. And so that was, you know, on one hand that was like, okay, well, good. This is validating. On the other hand, it's depressing. Cause it's like, wow, the person who's sitting in the seat of the service sometimes doesn't know what it is. So the short answer to your question is yes, we do penetration testing, but the person who <laughs> needs penetration testing might not even realize necessarily what it is, but basically any service, any service that helps people understand their vulnerabilities and, and fix them. And then we also have a, uh, a team of software developers who help build products securely. So that's most, most development functions are focused on development. Ours is focused on the security aspect of development. And, uh, and then a big part of that is of course, um, management of vendor security risk. So enterprise A wants to work with vendors one, two, and three. How do they know that vendors one, two, and three are secure? And managing that process is something we help with too. Very cool. So on your website, I noticed ISC has done some car hacking as well. Is that true? Yeah, we've done some pretty cool pieces of research. The, the very first one was car hacking. And that's kind of a fun story. Uh, that was uh, all the way back in 2005. And you think about how many lifetimes ago that feels like. That was when my, my business partner, Steve, and a couple of his colleagues in the PhD program at Johns Hopkins, they were deciding what research they were going to do next. And they came across this claim that was being made about the what's called the immobilizer function in cars. And that basically it plays a role in the ignition sequence in order to prevent theft, right? It basically says... When you stick the key in and you turn the key, is this the authentic key? And there's a chip in the key. It communicates with the computer on the uh, on board in the vehicle. And that communication was at the time considered to be, an, you know, put this in air quotes, unhackable. Like any hacker mind computer scientist, Steve and his colleagues, they were like, okay, challenge accepted. Let's, let's go take a look at this. And uh, so they went out and it took a few weeks to reverse engineer the cryptographic algorithm. And then a few weeks to build a weaponized software radio. 
And then a few weeks later, there they were you know, sitting in this, you know, desolate parking lot in a blustery winter, you know, Baltimore morning. And they started this car without the authentic key that was supposedly, you know, unhackable. And that story, I mean, besides being kind of awesome, um, that story would be newsworthy today, you know, in 2021. Oh, yeah. Back in 2005, there weren't as many people publishing research. And part of the reason for that is because companies basically just sued security research. That was like they didn't know how to deal with people of our ilk. And so they would sue them. And so and somehow we did not get sued. I still marvel at how we threaded that uh, particular needle. <laughs> but when we go to publish the research for obvious reasons, you know, because it was groundbreaking and certainly something that was not common at the time. It was picked up by media outlets all over the world. And what happened next was really interesting because then companies, they came calling. They read the story and they said, hey, it looks like you guys know how to find these vulnerabilities in software systems. Can you help us with what we're trying to build? And that was really the origin of what our company is today. And, you know, 16 years later, here we are, we're a lot more mature of an organization than a few dudes in, you know, in a PhD lab, just kind of hacking together a, a piece of research. But the, the fundamentals, the ethos is, is the same, is we're constantly looking at things to find the weakness so that we can help companies fix those weaknesses. Because the reality is, and this is sort of the premise uh, in a lot of ways of my book, which is that the question isn't whether or not vulnerabilities exist. They do. The question is, who will find them first? Will it be the attackers or will it be the ethical hackers? Will it be the good guys like us? And we think, I argue, that it needs to be the good guys because if you're building something, you need to ultimately get rid of those weaknesses in order to be successful in your, the mission that you're setting out to achieve. So that's the, the car hacking story. It was sort of uh, our origin story. I love it, man. And I guess you saw Tesla come up during that time, too, and the evolution of computer systems within their vehicles. Have you noticed car manufacturers are becoming better at security or are you still hacking cars? So we have not focused on the automotive world since that research very much. Um, but I obviously have observed it from afar and like, who's not interested in what Tesla is doing on like every aspect of their business model. I can give you some generalizations. So generally speaking, I do see on the whole, if you take in aggregate, you know, all companies that build systems, security is getting better. So if you looked at on average, all security across, this, across all systems today compared to all security across all systems, you know, 15 years ago, that level is higher. But that level relative to the scope of attack surface is not really getting better fast enough. And so we're seeing the world really broken into, if you can imagine a bell curve, it's almost like it's broken into these three parts, right? A bell curve, you know, starts little on the left hand and then there's like, it goes up and there's a big part in the middle and then it scopes down and there's a little part on the right. And when we think of the bell curve, the, the lower right part, the progressive organizations, they're the ones who are looking at security. They're doing it right. And they're, they're turning it into a competitive advantage for their business. And that's one of the arguments I make in my book. That's the argument we make to all of our customers. That's why many of our customers even hire us is they're like, yeah, security is cool and it's important. I get that, but we need to, make it return value to the business. And security done right absolutely does do that. And we can talk about that uh, later if you want. But the problem is when we think of that bell curve, the company's thinking that way. They're the little guys in the right-hand corner. And the majority of the world today is either in the middle, which is like, no, security is important, doesn't necessarily know how to do it, is trying to see it as like a cost to minimize. And then there's the people on the other end that are still head in the sand, don't realize that security is even a thing. And so that's sort of where the world is today. And I think that presents a lot of opportunity, actually, because companies who do do security right, who can figure out how to do it, invest in it appropriately, and then get that conversion, convert it into the business value. When you're in the minority and everyone else is in the majority, but the buyers want what the minority is providing, that's an enormous, enormous opportunity. Definitely. 
Although investment is a hard sell in many, many organizations, you know, being able to justify that cybersecurity spend. Oh, that's that's a huge problem for sure. And there are lots of smart people writing books and advocating for how to do that. And so uh, my the way that I advocate for how to solve that problem are a few. So one was, well, we have to understand the business justification because the reality, I'm an idealist, right? And I look at security and I'm like, security matters because security is the right thing to do. And the way I always think about it is um, being kind to your, you, being kind to your neighbor, right? Your neighbor slips and falls. You're going to go run over there and pick your neighbor up because it's the right thing to do. You're not going to do it out of expectation of some sort of compensation or some sort of return. It's inherently a good thing. You do it because it itself is worth doing. And I believe that security is like that. But I, I'm also a pragmatist and I realize that we live in a capitalist society and even things that are the right thing to do, companies just aren't going to do them unless there's a business case for it. And as I was thinking about that scenario, then I started thinking about, okay, well, I looked at our customer base and I said, well, why do these companies hire us? And why do they spend a lot of money on us? You know, is it, is it because it's the right thing to do? And pretty much universally across the board, while they do all believe security is the right thing to do, it's part of their ethos. It's really clear that almost all of them look at it to say, well, I need a, uh, I'm trying to gain a competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage is this. Most buyers of solutions or services, like any company that buys anything from someone else, whether that's a license or a subscription or, or even a um, mergers and acquisition activity, they want that software system to be secure. That's an expectation. Of course, they want it to do the things that they want it to do, solve whatever the problem is, but the expectation is this should be secure. So that's one factor we have to keep in mind, that the buyer expects security. The second factor we have to keep in mind is that almost nobody does it right, let alone talks about it right. I actually did a little study in the context of this book because I want to put some data to that point that I just made. And so I looked at 200 enterprise class uh, applications. So SaaS systems, whatever. And of those 200, only 4% of them actually talked about security right. Actually talked about it right and did it right. And so you look at that and think about that. 100% of the buyers want X, but 96% of sellers don't give it to them. If you can be in that 4%, that is an enormous opportunity. And so that's the case that I make to companies to talk about how do you justify security? Don't think about it. I mean, you do need to think about it in terms of reducing risk. No doubt, I'm not in any way saying we should get rid of the field of risk. That's critically important. But a lot of members in the, of the, uh, the executive suite, they look at that as like, well, I'm willing to roll the dice. You know, that's, that's kind of the attitude. And so they're willing to say, well, maybe we'll spend a little bit less until this bites us in the butt. But if, they're, if instead they're presented with something to say, look, here's how you can make money. You can close more deals, faster, bigger deals. You can better differentiate from the competition. You can actually close a door behind you to your competitors to say, hey, I'm through the door. These guys aren't. That's enormously powerful. And that is what gets a lot of companies in gear. And so that's one of the things that I really advocate for is um, while you do need to think about it in terms of avoidance of a bad thing, like let's not get hacked. Think about it in terms of obtaining a good thing, which is sales, customer, market penetration, competitive advantage. That's a great perspective because you don't see it often. I think you need to start consulting these software developers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we do in a lot of ways. And it's funny because I wrote, uh, when I was setting out to write the book, you know, you, you don't want to write a book to everybody. You want to pick a specific audience who has a specific problem that you know how to solve and go solve that problem. Because when you try to be everything to everybody, you wind up being nothing to nobody, right? You're kind of, it's too watered down. So like if I, I could have written a book about the principles of security and then it would have been like, eh. But if I write a book about application security, every person building software is like, that's my problem right there. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. And when I think about the audience for that, I said, okay, well, who am I talking to? I literally wrote the book as if I'm talking to somebody. Who's the person that I'm across the table having a beer with talking to? And that person was the sort of CTO equivalent. And 
So that was the primary audience, right? The, the person who's responsible for the security of their software system, but it might not even necessarily be their job, right? They might have somebody that reports to them, but nevertheless, if there's a breach, who's at the other end of the pointed finger saying, hey, what happened here? That's sort of the core audience. But then as the book came out, the, a really surprising thing happened because that was my primary audience was CTOs. And my secondary audience was develop, software developers and security professionals. And I, I've organized it that way, not because those audiences aren't served by this book, but to say that I had to be really clear on who the, the primary audience was. But as I thought about it, I'm like, these same principles really matter to the developers and to security professionals. And when the book came out, those two audiences are the ones who have really been banging down the door as much as the sort of leadership audience that I wrote it for. And that to me has been really rewarding to know that i am been able to actually address and solve problems for a wide range of people by having such a narrow focus. Yeah, hundred percent. I actually wanted to hit on that. You know, application security is not only the responsibility of a developer, leader, an analyst, you know, each role is critical. In terms of developers, though, do you still believe security is an afterthought or do you see public vulnerabilities causing more pressure for organizations to increase security within the development life cycle? I think the problem for developers is a little different than the problem for the exa- the leadership. The problem for the leadership is they're trying to make this business case and they're like, well, I only have so many resources. They can only go in so many places and I've got to figure out how to balance those constraints. And because most organizations don't understand how to think about security in the context of the business value, security winds up being this thing like, okay, well, that's kind of like overhead. That's kind of like taxes. How do we reduce those things? Um, So that's the problem that leadership has. They don't necessarily understand how to think about it from a business standpoint. And then because of that, then they don't know even what the right approach is. And gotcha. again, I'm not, that's not, I'm not uh, making a value judgment of anybody. I'm not saying that they're stupid for thinking that's just the unfortunate they, reality. They find themselves in that situation. Like, what do I do with this? And that's why they read a book like this, but developers problems are a little different. So a software developer, they have a few challenges. So one challenge is that the leadership determines where they prioritize their time and effort. And if the leadership doesn't necessarily prioritize security, how is the developer ever going to do that? The second problem is that security is typically not core to most training for most software developers. Um, if you look at, I mean, any computer science program in the United States, maybe there's a class on security. Maybe there's a like club on ethical hacking, but it's real. It's not the core. And there are security degree programs popping up, but the point that I'm I'm making is that developers are first trained to develop and then it's like, oh, also you got to make it secure. Now, the ones who are actually, because there, pl- there are plenty of developers who are really good at security, they care about it, they're, they prioritize it, they spend a lot of time and effort studying it. And then for those people, they still don't have enough time to do everything that they need to do in the way they need to do it. The business kind of breathes down their neck with looming deadlines and stuff. They get really demoralized when they're like, I just built that thing last year. I now have to go rebuild it because it turns out there's this big security flaw we didn't know about. And my you know, boss was forcing me to hit this deadline. I wasn't able to work with an outside security partner to help me make sure we got it right the first time. So those are obviously related problems to what the leadership faces, but they're really different. And uh, I address, I mean, all of those problems in this book, how to think about it. Yeah. I'm stoked about the new book, Hackable, how to do application security, right? It's number one on Amazon right now. How was writing the book during the COVID pandemic? Did that have an impact on you? It, it, to some extent, it made certain parts harder and it made certain opportunities appear otherwise. So for example, I typically travel a lot and I just know about myself that while I work on planes really well, that's not a conducive place for creativity and writing. So I think that would have really been more disruptive. So I was able to probably produce the book faster because I was basically at home almost every day. Um, But when I think about why I wrote the book, I noticed a couple things. So I mentioned that, you know, I'm a, a partner in this security consulting company. We, we work with companies every day trying to solve their security challenges and trying to build better, more secure software systems. And I noticed something that was happening. 
And what was happening was that pretty much every meeting that I had, whether it was with customers or prospective customers or just meeting people out in the community when I'm giving talks or whatever, the same 10 problems kept coming up. And not everyone had all 10 problems necessarily, but everyone had at least some of these 10 problems. And I thought that was really interesting. Once I first, once I, that actually permeated my brain and I acknowledged that, hey, there's, there's this trend here. There's these 10 issues. Then I started thinking about, well, how do you solve those problems? And that was the moment that was the swift kick in my butt to get me into gear to write this book. Because when I looked at what are the conventional solutions, what do people say are the solutions to these common problems? Almost across the board, they were completely backwards. And that to me, I rejected that. I found that to be unacceptable because think about what that means. That means that you've got someone who's building something. They're on a mission, right? They want to build this software system that changes the world in some way. So that's the first thing. Then they realize, hey, this security thing, I, I, I've got to figure, I got to figure it out. But I've got a couple of problems, or I've got multiple problems, or I've got 10 problems. So then they're, they're smart people. So they're like, all right, well, let me go solve those problems. Then the solution that's told to them about their problem is incorrect. And they don't know it because how could they know it? They have the problem. The, ex, the, uh, the experts are telling them this is the solution or they're reading the solution this way online. And I'm like, man, that is a tragedy. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to build a software system. It's hard enough to do security. And then to think that the advice on how to approach it is actually incorrect. That was like, no more. This, I know how to solve these problems. I've acquired the knowledge, the expertise. The, I've got stories for days. And it would be irresponsible to do anything other than go teach people how to solve those problems. And so I put it all into the book. I mean, literally the same advice that we give our customers. I mean, the only thing that I couldn't really put into the book is an actual security assessment. Like you, you can't read a book that's like, I'm now assessing your custom SaaS, but like, you just can't do that. <laughs> but I told you how we would do it. I said, you know, this is the step that you should do first. Then you do this step, then you do this step. and that's my hope is that by putting this out in the world, I can't talk to everybody. Like there's limits on my time. I can't talk to every single company that has these problems, but a book can magnify my reach. And so that was really what I was hoping to do was share the knowledge that I'd acquired, teach people how to solve these problems that they might not even realize are uh, so complicated and, uh, and just take this knowledge of our consulting practice, our penetration testing and security assessments. How do we, the same way we've helped these big enterprises and these startups that no one's heard of yet, yet, uh, the same way we've helped them. How do I help other people? That was the goal. That's awesome, man. And yeah, my copy is on the way. I can't wait to read it. Yes, I still prefer hard copies. Um, so you mentioned traveling and I've always enjoyed traveling out to Vegas to attend Black Hat, DEF CON, B-Sides. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to uh, DEF CON safe mode last year. But I know you co-founded IoT Village, which you see at DEF CON, RSA, and other security conferences. For those that aren't aware, would you mind explaining what IoT Village is? Yeah, there's a, it's, it's kind of a fun story arc for where we got to. Uh, so first, we have to describe what DEF CON is. So if people know what DEF CON is, that's the largest security research conference in the world. Um, and it's like the hacker dojo you show up and it's just bad it's body a, odor yeah. and like <laughs> crazy haircuts and everyone wears black t-shirts and it's it feels so underground and it's you feel like you're home you, know, you feel like you're for security people you feel like you're home and you're not in um this big corporate environment even though there are obviously companies there you're like this is where people come to learn practitioners want to come hands-on people who aren't yet practitioners but want to be uh, want to become one someday they show up. So Defcon is just an incredible, incredible community as much as it is a conference. And Defcon has these um, different content areas, and it's this concept called villages. And so a village is almost like a conference within a conference, and they're focused on a particular topic area. And so up until this was probably I want to say like I forget the exact year, but it was probably around two thousand. 
2015, maybe 2013, somewhere in that range, DEF CON had something like, I forget the exact number, but it was maybe 15 villages or something. There weren't really that many. And there was an opportunity that we had where we had just published some research that showed all this hacking of all these routers. We showed how the routers that you have at your house, I have at my house, everyone has in their small office. They were vulnerable to all these different types of attacks. And DEF CON, uh, I can't remember if they approached us or we approached them, but somehow we had this conversation with DEF CON about, well, why don't we turn that into some sort of contest at DEF CON? And they're like, okay, well, you're proven researchers, but you're like, to, to, in DEF CON's eyes, to us, you're like this, who are you? We don't know you yet. And in terms of producing any content. And so, <laughs> you know, when you go to a conference and there's like the main area where whatever's happening. And then you go to like, you go down a hallway and that's where some of the smaller rooms are. And then you go down another hallway and this even smaller rooms. And then there's like another hallway. Yeah. So yeah. we're like yet another hallway down from there. <laughs> we're in this room. We're in the back corner of it. Just one table, like three or four of us literally behind a trash barrel. I mean, like people were throwing trash at us. I mean, not meaning to throw trashes, but there were more than one time where a piece of trash landed on our desk. And we're like, talk about humble beginnings. <laughs> but it, you know, that event, it, the contest went really well. We did, um, we figured out some sort of guerrilla marketing techniques to figure out how do you get people down a hallway, down a hallway, down a hallway, down a hallway to a back corner of a room that's not ours. We, we were able to figure that out. Um, primarily giving away t-shirts. We ran like all these contests and it got people coming there. So the contest went really, really well. And then the next year, that was the year when the internet of things was starting to, people were starting to recognize like, Hey, this is a thing. Yeah. I mean, do you think that was because IOT wasn't as popular then and people didn't really own IOT devices at that point? I mean, I would argue that IOT has been around for a very long time, but the, the sort of badge of like IOT is a thing, you know, now gotcha. was starting to make its way into mainstream nomenclature, I guess. And yeah, yeah. so the, we had a conversation with DEF CON after that first contest. And again, I can't remember if they reached out to us or reached out to them, but we had this conversation that was, was in hindsight, like pretty damn bold. We're like, why don't we create a new village focused on IOT? And DEF CON was like, hey, that contest went great. We like you guys, go for it. And we're like, now what? <laughs> now we got to actually create a village. And so we went and we, we put together this village that's focused on really highlighting security challenges in the internet of things. And that's really how it started. It was like, let's get routers and let's get connected washing machines and ovens and uh, we've had ATMs, we've had all kinds of stuff. Like one, one talk, a dude uh, shot a drone out of the sky by issuing a command. He was like, kill. And then the drone like fell out of the sky. So all these, you know, cool things really happened. We had researchers come present research. We had people give talks. We had workshops. We have a capture the flag contest. And our capture the flag contest wound up being really successful in that it it attracted so many people who are so talented that DEF CON has this concept called the black badge. And the black badge is kind of like the hall of fame jacket for the NFL or, you know, pick your sports league. It's like here, here's this lifetime designation of your awesomeness. And so if you get bestowed a black badge, that's like getting that honor. And um, our contest wound up being so badass that, the winner of it was was given a black badge by DEF CON, which is this like lifetime designation, amazingness. And uh, so that happened actually not once, not twice, but three years in a row. So that's like crazy that we created, that's one, that's probably the thing I'm most proud of. We created a platform that en enabled others to achieve, you know, their pursuit of greatness, level up their professional uh, career, share the vision of what IoT security is about. And now, you know, I'm obviously biased because. I'm one of the people who put it together, but I would argue that IoT Village is the best, or at least one of the best villages that uh, that happens at DEF CON. It just like these this purple light that is behind me is actually from DEF CON or from oh, nice. uh, from our IoT Village traveling circus. I was like, yoink, that's going to be in my home office now. So this is like <laughs> an events grade <laughs> light. This isn't some like cheap little light bulb. This is like a expensive, way overkill for my office. But, um, but that's, you know, that's what it is. We've, we've got this, we build a community, right? We bring people together. Let's talk about 
the security challenges in IoT. Let's hack stuff together. Let's let's make sure we're teaching the next wave of entrance into uh, the security community. Let's make sure that we're highlighting the research of you know people who are making contributions. And it's just been a really, really inspiring and enjoyable thing that we've done for you know five or six years now. That's awesome, man. And with DEF CON, you already have the elite of the elite, you know, already on site. You don't need to hunt them down. They come to you. So yeah, IoT Village is great. I highly recommend stopping by for anyone attending DEF CON. And hopefully we'll be able to see DEF CON on site once again in 2021. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Did you guys participate in DEF CON safe mode in 2020? And if so, you know, how did that translate for you guys? Yeah, the move to virtual wound up being a, a positive, I think, for us, which is crazy to think. It's like, wait, you run an event and you can't run an event. That's a positive. How? <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, there was kind of a funny uh, moment to this where we, the very beginning of last year, we hired this new person to take over running our event series because IoT Village, of course, it started at DEF CON, but now it goes to conferences all over the country and even places around the globe too. And so we wanted to bring someone to make that the dedicated focus for that person, you know, still using other resources across our company, but like your job is you run events. So this person joins the company literally the week that quarantine, that shutdown starts. So we're like, welcome to the company. You can't meet your coworkers. And she still actually hasn't met most of her coworkers in person. Oh, also, we have to change the entire format from an in-person event to a virtual event. Get to know our culture, get to know this event's culture, get to know how to run it. Oh, and you have to change the format. Um, also, you can't interact with anyone in person. Good luck. That's like a crazy tall barrier. Um, and But the whole IoT Village team, they really looked at, this as an opportunity. And they said, okay, well, we can't physically go to events and we have sponsors who want to get value out of this. How can we continue to deliver content, deliver value to our sponsors? And the shift to virtual wound up being just amazing because number one, we could reach people across the planet. So the the barrier had been removed of you need to get on an airplane. So we Mm -hmm. did an event in India where uh, it was maybe one of our most successful events so far. There was so much interest and appetite for it. And what's crazy is it's like, man, those same people to attend that, first of all, they, they might not have been able to because of exchange rates and things like that, plus the time to travel. And so, you know, if maybe, even if it's like 5% of that audience maybe would have physically traveled to, to DEF CON, that's probably a high estimate. And think 95% of that audience is a completely new audience. So we're able to, you know, get around travel restrictions, get around uh, any sort of visa requirements or limitations that might prevent someone from coming to the United States. Uh, Of course, our material expenses went down because we didn't have to travel or ship things, which meant we could do more. So we could do more events and and our sponsors loved it because they paid for X, but they got like three X in terms of reach and impact. And it just wound up being a really good thing. So I am very much looking forward to live events coming back, but there's no doubt that we will move into a hybrid of live and virtual because it's just so good for so many people. Yeah. I was going to ask you if if you were planning to shift to a hybrid model. I mean, it makes sense. Um, I think both you and the participants would both gain value from that. You know, in many ways, COVID has been detrimental to a lot of people, although in other ways, it has exposed the possibilities and value for events such as this to go virtual. 100%. So you also host the Tech Done Different podcast. Can you tell us about that program and also where our listeners can find it? Yeah, I knew once I finished writing my book that I was going to do a podcast just because one of the things that I really enjoyed about the writing process was talking to people whose problems I was trying to solve. Right. So literally part of the writing process was calling up those CTO or equivalent and saying, tell me about your problem. Tell, why does this suck? Or why does that like, why is that a problem? What do you do? And, and helping put me in their shoes. I really enjoyed that sort of interview process. And so I was like, man, I could probably do a podcast. And so at first the thinking was, oh, well, I'll call it the hackable podcast. <laughs> And then I'm like, that would be a good name for the podcast. And, you know, obviously put 
continued, uh, you know, emphasis on the book and everything. But I'm like, but the guests that I want on my show, I really want those, those CTOs or equivalent. I want those to be at least like half of my guests. And are they going to show up on a show where they think I'm going to be making them talk about their security vulnerabilities? And I'm like, that doesn't really serve the guests. That serves me, which is the exact wrong reason to do anything. Uh, I want, I need to start with how do I serve someone else? And then from once I figure out how I serve someone else, figure out how can I make that serve me? That has to be the order of operations. And so that's why I went with the concept being tech done different because I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to serve the people in technology or in security who are responsible for securing these software systems, what do I need to do for them? Okay, well, I need to help them think differently. That's the big problem that I see in where security system or yeah, security approaches fail is that they're thinking in these like herd mentalities of the wrong approaches. So I want to make people think differently. So that's where the name certainly comes from, you know, tech done different. From there, it's yeah, I have about 50% of my guests wind up being those people who are directly that, you know, CTOs or even developers or security professionals. Um, and then the other half wind up being people completely outside of technology and security in order to inject that different level of thinking. So I've had Olympians, uh, Olympic champions, even not just Olympians, but like gold medalists. I've had uh, Las Vegas headliners. I've had the, the guy who runs the FBI behavioral analysis unit. I mean, I've had these just like, and let's be honest, that serves me a little bit too. I'm like, oh, there's a cool person I want to talk to. Let's have oh, them on the show. It's, it's really, really fun to, to say like, okay, wait a minute. So people think X, but they should do Y. Like that's essentially what the conversation winds up being. Nice, man. It sounds like an awesome show. Is it on Apple podcasts or is there a link to it on your website? Yeah. If you go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, all the information about the show is there and where to get episodes. So, and yeah, cool. it's on all of the major platforms. There's, there's a little bit of a weirdness in terms of finding it in that my podcast is part of a podcast family that's called ITSP Magazine. And so it actually posts under ITSP Magazine. Um, okay. But the easiest way is just go to tedherring.com backslash podcast. And that's where all the episodes are directly linked. Cool, man. Well, it sounds like a great show. Uh, you know, thanks for sharing that information. I'll get the links up on my site as well. And, you know, Barcode, we are a cybersecurity themed bar. Uh, we take security very, very seriously. As you probably realized when MFA was required to get through the front door. Uh, so I'm curious, do you have any cool bar hacking stories? I do. I actually do. Yes. I tell this story. So this is technically a social engineering story, but I, I actually write about this story in my book and I, I tell it as a way to support the concept, to explain the concept of what it means to think like a hacker. Like my advocacy is always that, hey, to do security right, you got to have the right mindset. You got you to think like a hacker. And then people are like, okay, what does that mean? And, you know, of course we should first differentiate that hacker is not inherently good or bad. It's just someone who solves problems, is creative and sees the way things are supposed to work and says, can they work differently? That's fundamentally what a hacker is. The media has really abused that term to pretty much only mean a bad thing. Uh, attackers are hackers. You know, they, they look at a system, they try to say, how does it work? Can it work differently? And then their motivation is something malicious. Ethical hackers follow part of the same steps, right? We look at a system, we try to understand how it works. We try to understand, can it work differently? And when we find that it can, then what we're doing is not trying to hurt the system. We're trying to say, okay, let's change that. And so when people are like, okay, well, explain that to me that I literally use a bar story to explain it. Cause I, you know, most people have been to a bar and I mean, maybe not everybody likes drinking, but uh, at least can relate to the idea of, of being in a line to then have to pay to have access to something. And I remember this time uh, a few years ago when I show up at this bar, that's not far from here in my, uh, my home in San Diego. And there's a long line and there's a $20 cover charge to get in. And I can't remember why I needed to go to this specific bar, but I needed to go to the, I, maybe there was a birthday party or I think maybe friends were in there, but it wasn't like, I don't want that line. I'll just go to this other bar. It was like, I need to go to this bar and this line's in my way. And so I did what really any hacker would do is I looked at, well, how does the system work and can I make it behave differently? And so I understood that there was a uh, authorization model, right? You could 
if you had elevated privileges, you could go on a VIP line. And if you didn't, you go in this regular line. And the VIP line, you didn't have to wait. There wasn't the line and there wasn't the cover. And so I look at this, I'm like, well, I don't want to wait in line. I want to escalate my privileges. I want to go in VIP. I'm not VIP, but I need to figure out how do I go in there? So then I assessed, okay, well, how does the system work? So the VIP process operates under an assumption that if you say you're on the list and you're actually on the list, you can come in. So I'm like, okay, so I now know what I need to do. My goal is I need to be associated with that list that I am not associated with. So what I did was I walk right up to the VIP hostess. And I said, hi, I'm on the list. Now, remember, I'm not on the list, but I needed her to think that I was. So I say, hi, I'm on the list. And she says, great, what's your name? Now, because I'm not on the list, giving her my name is not going to help. And guessing is like the chances I guess someone's name off that list is it's just why even try. So rather than giving her an answer, I give her a vague and misleading statement. And this is what attackers do is they have these what's called specially crafted inputs in order to sort of probe a system to see how it will react. So my specially crafted input was I said, I'm with the group. Again, she says, great, which one? Now, again, I'm not with a group. I don't know the names of any groups, but I need her to think that I'm with one. And I'm also operating under the assumption that if I can produce a group's name, that is enough to verify that I'm with the group and thus I will be able to get in. So she says, oh, great, which group? I don't know the group, any of the names of the groups. So again, I use a specially crafted input and I say, I'm with the big group. I'm making an assumption that one group is larger than another group. And with that, you know, she looks down her clipboard, flips through a couple of pages. She says, oh, the Smith group. And, uh, you know, so she opens the velvet rope and escorts me right past the, the cashier. And, uh, and I go right into the bar. And that was the exact process that an attacker goes through, right? Evaluate the system, identify the assumptions, issue some specially crafted inputs to see how the system will behave. When you find a vulnerability, which in this case I did when she revealed a name on the list, then an attacker exploits it or an ethical hacker, you know, identifies it. And uh, don't worry though, I, even though I didn't pay my cover, I more than made up for it in my bar tab and I way over tipped everybody. So I didn't feel good about like defeating that, but I was like, I'm just not waiting in line. It's not about the money. It's about the line. And so, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good example of it's obviously social engineering, but the same process applies if you're attacking a network, if you're attacking a software system, it's essentially the same process. Dude, that is a wild story. And I think that needs to be the main focus of your next book, hacking cars. I think it would be a hit. Um, yeah. So you mentioned you're located out there in San Diego. You know, what are the cool bars to go to out there? Are there any secret bars or speakeasies that you know of? Yeah. Yeah. There definitely are speakeasies, but I don't know what's going to survive right now. But um, one of the ones that's pretty cool, it's called Noble Experiment. And it's inside this other bar called The Neighborhood. And that that place is all boarded up right now. I don't know if it's going to come back or not, but the concept was pretty cool. It's like you walk in and you're already in this cool bar. But if you know about the speakeasy, when you go to the, so when you go to the bathroom, there's a wall of like all the empty kegs mm -hmm. and you actually push through, it's a door. You can't see it because the door is the seam of the different kegs. And then you're in there and it's like, you know, 15 seats. There's not, I don't even think there's a menu. It's just custom craft cocktails. And it's like only candle lit. And it's just like places like that. There's, there's a bunch of them. So I love it, man. So it's last call here. I have one last question for you. If you opened a cybersecurity themed bar, what would the name be? And what would your signature drink be called? Well, I'd probably call the bar unhackable because I want everybody to be like, what? I got to see what this nonsense is about. And then they come in and they're like, oh, this is a pretty great bar. You say unhackable and it's going to attract uh, the security minded folk. So uh, my bar is called unhackable. Um, then they come in and they're like, oh, I get it. I'm getting trolled right now. That's cool. <laughs> let's, let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and my signature drink would be a series of drinks. Uh, it would be called the exploit chain. And it would be like, I don't know, a shot of Jack and then a shot of like rumple mints and then a beer or something like maybe those are nasty together, but the idea of like a few things together that you're like, Oh, that's a great combination of, 
of uh, stuff. Nah, that sounds epic, man. And if you build it in San Diego, I'm flying out for sure. So for those listening, check out Amazon for the book. Check out tedharrington.com, you know, which includes your portfolio, a link to ISC, a hype video for the book, which got me amped up about it. You know, it's the first time I ever saw a hype video for a book, but you pulled it off. Ted, thank you so much for joining me. You know, I wish you much continued success. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much for having me and thank everybody for listening. You know, however I can help you, feel free to hit me up on my website. As Chris mentioned, uh, I answer pretty much any question that's sent. So however I can help you, let me help you. We appreciate you for that. Take care and be safe. All right. Thank you. Barco patrons, if you enjoyed this episode and want an easy way to support the podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. If you're not on a Mac or iPhone, just visit the barcodepodcast.com slash reviews. I appreciate all the support. Cheers. Unfortunately, it's time to shut the bar down for this episode. Thanks for stopping in. See you next time. We'll save you a seat. Be sure to check us out at thebarcodepodcast.com.